Hello and welcome to the Lazy Book Club podcast, the book club for those who don't want to read or leave the house. My name is Matt Gonzalez. Hello there, pot pickers. It's David Cox. And I'm Josh Matheson. Is that you doing your like Tony Blackburn impression? There? No, I actually <laughs> held back. I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> Good evening, like, pot pickers. On Radio Norwich or something like that. Like. Yeah. <laughs> This week we are looking at chapter nine of The Mysterious Fair at Styles. Now, I'm going to have a problem with this chapter because it's basically called the one character that I can never get his name right. So yeah, that's correct. this chapter is called Dr. Bowerstein, not Dr. Bernstein. Right. So last week we had Poirot doing a bit more investigating. It was fresh suspicions. We just found out that Alfred was had an alibi. He was at Rake's farm. Now, what I didn't realise, because I only even noticed it until I went back, Alfred hasn't admitted to having an affair with the lady at Rake's farm. He's just admitted that he was with the woman at Rake's farm. And the reason he didn't want to say that he was at Rake's farm was because he knew that there was a rumour going around that he was having an affair with her. Yeah. To see where I'm going. So it's actually yeah. completely innocent as far as he's concerned. It but he knows like that there's... He might have just been... Help- exactly. Or just like chopping wood for her or something like that. So Maybe she's got one of those farms where they, you can pick your own fruit. <laughs> he's That's picking it. blueberries. <laughs> her strawberries are the best at this time of year. <laughs> and I couldn't <laughs> say no. But this is the thing. I do, I do feel like his problem is, is the way he looks. Everybody looks at him and just immediately goes, you're a scoundrel. You've got a big beard. You've got a wooden hand. You look like you should be on a pirate ship. So you must be a pirate. We can't trust you. And so everybody just assumes that he's up to no good, even if he is just helping some lady you know, mend some fences and, you know, pick some blueberries. I don't know, but... Very true. Yeah, the poor he also guy. gets followed around by a man with a 1920s piano on the back of a trailer. And it's this guy in a striped t-shirt <laughs> and a boat hat going... Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it's, a, it's very expensive, but it just... Uh, it's worth every penny, though, just for the yeah. drama alone. We know Poirot. Um, Evelyn, Evelyn's paid for it just to, like, back her up. <laughs> <laughs> it was oh. worth the money. <laughs> <laughs> so last week, Poirot was testing out Mary Cavendish's alibi by pushing over the table when the Scotland Yard guys were in there. And he asked mm. Hastings, did you hear the bump? And he said, nope. So her alibi doesn't hold water. She obviously didn't hear the table knock over. So whether she's the murderer or whether she was up to something else that night and the reason why she was up, which I think is probably more likely due to Dr. Bowerstein being around. Um, she couldn't have been woken up by the table. Oh, no, the big reveal, sorry, at the end was Evelyn basically s- admitting that she was stifling who she actually thought did the murder thought, because she just possibly. couldn't bear it. But yeah. now oh, she's on, on the side was, of justice. This was the side <laughs> of yeah, justice. Yeah, it was like it was a two four six zero one moment, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Except she was in the middle of a village green, and there was like a man and his dog around. It Not was a spotlight room. revelation moment. That's what it was. It was that <laughs> this is me. this is who i'm trying to be this is me (laughs) 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 oh god no one's paying to hear her sing that it wasn't it her british brawn and bravery oh yes a lady of british (laughs) brawn and it sounded yeah. like a pork pie, I don't know. It did, it did. It sounded like a type of dog food. Melton Mowbray with Piccadilly. <laughs> <laughs> but now it means that Poirot has an ally. So I, I'm thinking that he might be using this person to gather information when he's not around, hopefully get a few people talking and kind of get a bit of dirt off of people, have an inside woman kind of, you know, helping him out, feeding him back info. So... This could be quite interesting. Poirot definitely seems to be the kind of detective who likes to work in the shadows and kind of do things and then just bring it all into the light at the end, which obviously works for Agatha in terms of her writing style because it'd be really boring if he told everyone the answers halfway through. But True. 
he definitely likes a bit of drama and likes to work in the shadows and likes not being the center of attention all the time. So I'm interested to see if this is a, a spotlight shift back onto Dr. Bowerstein or onto Dr. Bowerstein now, subject to who, you know, could he be guilty? Um, so, yeah, I think we should just dive in and see, see what Dr. Bowerstein has hidden up his sleeve or what he's mm. trying to hide. Chapter 9, Dr. Bowerstein. I had had no opportunity as yet of passing on Poirot's message to Lawrence. But now, as I strolled out on the lawn, still nursing a grudge against my friend's high-handedness, I saw Lawrence on the croquet lawn, aimlessly knocking a couple of very ancient balls about, with a still more ancient mallet. It struck me that it would be a good opportunity to deliver my message, Otherwise, Poirot himself might relieve me of it. It was true that I did not quite gather its purport, but I flattered myself that by Lawrence's reply, and perhaps a little skilful cross-examination on my part, I should soon perceive its significance. Accordingly, I accosted him. Oh, so this was the extra thing that I forgot. So Poirot's told Hastings to give him a message saying about the extra coffee oh, what cup. What was it? The extra coffee yeah. cup. Ask him right. about it and see what his reaction is. I do love how a Hastings is ever the optimist, isn't he? Going, maybe if I ask the question, I might work out why I'm asking it by his reaction. <laughs> I'm asking this question. I've got no idea why. Hopefully the answer might tell me. Like, just give up. You're not, you're not, yeah. you're not designed to be a detective. I like to think that Hastings is still sat in a room in 2021, still trying to work out. <laughs> <laughs> he's still scratching Who has his done head this? <laughs> Even scared, though he's the one writing like... the book. Is that what's going to oh, happen? No, We're going to get to the last chapter and he doesn't actually know who the murderer is because he hasn't worked it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to end, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for you, I remarked untruthfully. Oh, have you? Yes. The truth is, I've got a message for you from Poirot. Yes? He told me to wait until I was alone with you, I said, dropping my voice significantly and watching him intently out of the corner of my eye. I've always been rather good at what is called, I believe, creating an atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strange boast. That's a weird, yeah. That's such a weird boast. <laughs> I'm really good at making an atmosphere. Jackie says that to women. Should, I'm not sure. You should see me on dates. Ugh. It sounds like he's hitting on him. Could you imagine? I've been bit. looking for you. I've got a message dun, 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 He told me to dun, wait until dun, I was alone with you. Do you know what I mean? It's all very suggestive. If I was Lawrence, I'd be like going, oh, how do I let him down gently? <laughs> well, there was no change of expression in the dark, melancholic face. Had he any idea of what I was about to say? This is the message. I dropped my voice still lower. Find the extra coffee cup, and you can rest in peace. What on earth does he mean? Lawrence stared at me in quite an unaffected astonishment. Don't you know? Not in the least, do you? I was compelled to shake my head. What extra coffee cup? I don't know. He'd he better ask Dorcas or one of the maids if he wants to know about coffee cups. It's their business, not mine. I don't know anything about the coffee cups, except that we've got some that are never used, which are a perfect dream. Old Worcester. You're not a connoisseur, are you, Hastings? I shook my head. You miss a lot. A really perfect bit of old china. It's pure delight to handle it or even to look at it. Well, what am I to tell Poirot? Tell him I don't know what he's talking about. It's double Dutch to me. 
All right. I was moving off towards the house again when he suddenly called me back. I, I say, what was the end of that message? Say it again, will you? Find the extra coffee cup and you can rest in peace. Are you sure you don't know what it means? I asked him earnestly. He shook his head. No, he said musingly. I don't. I, I wish I did. The boom of the gong sounded from the house, and we went in together. Wait, sorry, Poirot. the gong? <laughs> <laughs> Why is there I, a gong? I would gong? imagine... I would imagine it's the dinner gong, Matt. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, I know, but How it's big? like they're not in China. Like, or it's the start of the uh, gladiator tournament that happened. <laughs> yeah, <in China. laughs> the, those inflatable sumo suits have been broken out for after dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to just a good old fashioned school bell? Do you know what I mean? Just ring a bell. <laughs> oh, you don't need a gong. People trying to make it fancy. They talk about the dinner gong in Downton Abbey quite. A bit quite a lot oh, okay fair enough all right I talk about, yeah one of those huge, i've done one of these really big ones I remember them just like a theater i worked at just for an evening mm. that was just one side of the stage and it's like one of those things you just you literally like i shouldn't but i've never done hard it to resist it's just yeah the most it's one of the most satisfying things yeah. i've ever done oh. it's like still making noise a minute and a half later yeah it just <laughs> reverberates so much and everyone's uh. like what are you doing i was like sorry like, <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good like, word sorry not well. sorry gong 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 also a name for a prize it's almost uh that yeah that's what i'm gonna say it sounds kind of as it sounds yeah that's it it's one of them poirot had been asked by john to remain to lunch and was already seated at the table by tacit consent all mention of the tragedy was barred we conversed on the war and other outside topics oh, keeping it light and fluffy with the war <laughs> none of this nasty Anna. business yeah typical what? rich folks going oh yeah all those poor people over there are fighting while yeah. we're still in our manor house all those tommies in the trenches yeah let's just forget about you know let's talk about them that doesn't affect us but after the cheese and biscuits had been handed round and Dorcas had left the room, Poirot suddenly leant forward to Mrs. Cavendish. Pardon me, madame, for recalling unpleasant memories, but I have a little idea. Poirot's little ideas were becoming a perfect byword and would like to ask you one or two questions. Hmm? Of me? Certainly. Oh, I've missed this voice. Oh, she isn't she isn't she delicious? You are too amiable, madame. Hmm? What I want to ask is this: the door leading into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room from that of Mademoiselle Cynthia. It was bolted. You say? Hmm? Certainly, it was bolted," replied Mary Cavendish, rather surprised. "I, I said so at the inquest. Bolted. Hmm? Yes." She looked perplexed. I mean, explained Poirot, are you sure it was bolted and not merely locked? Hmm? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, no, I don't know. I said bolted, meaning that it was fastened and I could not open it. But I believe all the doors were found bolted on the inside. Still, as far as you are concerned, the door might equally well have been locked, hmm? Oh, yes. You yourself did not happen to notice, madame, when you entered Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, whether that door was bolted or not, hmm? I, I, I believe it was, but you did not see it, hmm? No, I never looked. But I did, interrupted Lawrence suddenly. I happen to notice that it was bolted. Ah, that settles it, hmm? And Poirot looked crestfallen. I could not help rejoicing that for once one of his little ideas had come to naught, 
Oh, stop being After- petty, Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, he's going to be like, well, I'm going to get there. I want to get there first. He's like, oh, In I'm hindsight, not the only one again. who gets wrong. Yeah, I'm not the only one who makes mistakes, Poirot. <laughs> So I think what's what's significant there is obviously Poirot's trying to highlight is it locked or is it bolted? Because obviously a lock can be locked from either side. A bolt can only be bolted from one side. Mm -hmm. So it's quite significant because if it was from the inside, then only the person in the room could do it. If it was locked, then outside or inside could do it. After lunch, Poirot begged me to accompany him home. I consented rather stiffly. You are annoyed. Is it not so? Hmm? he asked anxiously as we walked through the park. Not at all, I said coldly. (laughs) That is well. That lifts a great load from my mind. Hmm. This was not quite what I had intended. Oh, how dare you not notice the fact that I'm not okay. (laughs) Definitely leaning into the pass bag. (laughs) (laughs) He's so passive aggressive. It's so annoying. Just say what you mean. I had hoped that he would have observed the stiffness of my manner. Still, the fervour of his words went towards the appeasing of my just displeasure. I thawed. I gave Lawrence your message, I said. And what did he say? Hmm? He was entirely puzzled. Hmm? Yes. I'm quite sure he had no idea of what you meant. I had expected Poirot to be disappointed, but to my surprise, he replied that that was as he had thought, and that he was very glad. My pride forbade me to ask any questions. Poirot switched off on another tack. Mademoiselle Cynthia was not at lunch today, hm? How was that? Uh, she's in hospital again. She resumed work today. Ah, she is an industrious little demoiselle, and pretty too, hm? She is like pictures I have seen in Italy. I would rather like to see that dispensary of hers. Do you think she would show it to me? Hmm? (laughs) I'm sure she would be delighted. It's an interesting little place. Does she go there every day? Hmm? Uh, She has all Wednesdays off and comes back to lunch on Saturdays. Those are her only times off. I will remember. Hmm. Women are doing great work nowadays. And Mademoiselle Cynthia is clever. Oh, yes, she has brains, that little one. Uh, Yes, I believe she has passed quite a stiff exam. Without doubt. Hmm. After all, it is very responsible work. I suppose they have very strong poisons there. Hmm? Uh, Yes, she showed them to us. They're kept locked up in a little cupboard. I believe they have to be very careful. They always take out the key before leaving the room. Indeed. Hmm. It is near the window, this cupboard. Hmm? Uh, No, right the other side of the room. Why? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. I wondered. That is all. Will you come in? Hmm? We had reached the cottage. Uh, No, I think I'll be getting back. I shall go round the long way, through the woods. The woods round Stiles were very beautiful. After the walk across the open park, it was pleasant to saunter lazily through the cool glades. There was hardly a breath of wind. The very chirp of the birds was faint and subdued. I strolled on a little way and finally flung myself down at the foot of a grand old beech tree. My thoughts of mankind were kindly and charitable. I even forgave Poirot for his absurd secrecy. In fact, I was at peace with the world. Then I yawned. I thought about the crime, and it struck me as being very unreal and far off. I yawned again. Probably, I thought, it really never happened. Of course, it was all a bad dream. The truth of the matter was that it was Lawrence who had murdered Alfred Inglethorpe with a croquet mallet. It was <laughs> absurd of John to make such a fuss about it and to go shouting out, I tell you, I won't have it. I woke up with a start. At once I realised that I was in a very awkward predicament. For about twelve feet away from me, John and Mary Cavendish were standing 
facing each other, and they were evidently quarrelling. And, quite as evidently, they were unaware of my vicinity, for before I could move or speak, John repeated the words which had aroused me from my dream. Sorry, 12 feet? That's not a Uh, lot. Four metres? Maybe he's in a bush or something. I mean, he's at the bottom of a tree. Maybe he's at the back of the tree and they're in front of the tree, maybe? the only way. I tell you, Mary, I won't have it. Mary's voice came cool and liquid. Have you any right to criticise my actions? It'll be the talk of the village. My mother was only buried on Saturday and here you are gadding about with the fellow. Oh, she shrugged her shoulders. If it's only village gossip that you mind. But it isn't. I've had enough of the fellow hanging about. He's a Polish Jew anyway. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. There it yeah. is. Flag. Oh, dear. Out. We There's get the down UK. to brass taxes. Woo! Oh, dear. I mean, we can, it's, we can see it, why John hired Dorcas, can't we? Yeah. I mean, it is amazing. When you read some of this literature, you go, for somebody to feel comfortable to put this in a mainstream book, it does show you how far society has come. Yeah, must, I mean, yeah. we've still got a long way to go, but you think in a hundred years, like you would never, ever have a character write something like that nowadays, unless you are writing a book where somebody is a racist and you know and they they're are dealing a with the racism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is a passing comment. This is just a flippant yeah. thing of like, oh, well, he's one of those. Do you know what I mean? So, to, for the author to feel comfortable to write that shows that that's obviously a societal norm at the time. It's the equivalent of now saying, but he wears corduroy. A tinge of Jewish blood is not a bad thing. It leavens that... She looked at him. Stolid stupidity of the ordinary Englishman. Fire in her eyes, ice in her voice. I did not wonder that the blood rose to John's face in a crimson tide. Mary! Well, her tone did not change. The pleading died out of his voice. Am I to understand that you will continue to see Bowerstein against my express wishes? If I choose. You defy me. No, but I deny your right to criticise my actions. Have you no friends of whom I should disapprove? John fell back a pace. The colour ebbed slowly from his face. What do you mean? he said in an unsteady voice. You see, said Mary quietly, you do see, don't you, that you have no right to dictate to me as to the choice of my friends. John glanced at her pleadingly, a stricken look on his face. No right? Have I no right, Mary? he said unsteadily. He stretched out his hands. Mary! For a moment, I thought she wavered. A softer expression came over her face. Then suddenly she turned almost fiercely away. None. She was walking away when John sprang after her and caught her by the arm. Mary! His voice was very quiet now. Are you in love with this fellow, Baustein? She hesitated, and suddenly there swept across her face a strange expression, old as the hills, yet with something eternally young about it. So might some Egyptian sphinx have smiled. She freed herself quietly from his arm and spoke over her shoulder. Perhaps, she said, and then swiftly passed out of the little glade, leaving John standing there as though he had been turned to stone. Rather ostentatiously, I stepped forward, crackling some dead branches with my feet as I did so. John turned. (laughs) Luckily, he took it for granted that I had only just come upon the scene. He's holding two, like, little... (laughs) 
uh, branches in his hand, like, and he's sort of disguised in, and he's got like camouflage. Yeah, he's like trying face. to like <laughs> creep out of the picture, out of the field, like covered in a bush. <laughs> <laughs> That is the most awkward conversation probably ever to stumble across, though, isn't it? Like, geez, mm-hmm. literally just said, yeah, maybe I do love him. And no, you can't tell me who I'm allowed to see and who I'm not allowed to see. Oh, dear. I mean, we had an idea that there was that theirs was the marriage that everyone was talking about actually being in trouble. That was obviously yeah. the seed that was sown of old Alfred's having an affair with the lady at Rake's farm. But actually, this, I think, was always the marriage that was mentioned in the argument Mm -hmm. i love that agatha who's like you know a a mystery writer is trying to write drama here and trying to write it's almost soap opera isn't it like the conversation they're having like spanish novella yeah yeah it's really there's no subtext is there no it's really on the nose and it's really like we're gonna talk really plainly in the middle of the garden where everyone can hear us if they walk past hello hastings have you seen the little fellow back safely to his cottage Quaint little chap. Is he any good, though? Really? He was considered one of the finest detectives of his day. Oh, well, I suppose there must be something in it, then. What a rotten world it is, though. You find it so? I asked. Good Lord, yes. There's this terrible business to start with. Scotland Yard men in and out of the house like a jack-in-the-box. Never know where they won't turn up next. Screaming headlines in every paper in the country. Damn all journalists, I say. Do you know, there was a whole crowd staring in at the lodge gates this morning. Sort of Madame Two Swords, Chamber of Horrors business that could be seen for nothing. Pretty thick, isn't it? Cheer up, John, I said soothingly. It can't last forever. Can't it, though? It can last long enough for us never to be able to hold up our heads again. No, no, you're getting morbid on the subject. Enough to make a man morbid to be stalked by beastly journalists and stared at by gaping moon-faced idiots wherever he goes. But it's worse than that. What? John lowered his voice. Have you ever thought, Hastings? It's a nightmare to me. Who did it? I can't help feeling sometimes it it must have been an accident because because who could have done it? Now Inglethorpe's out of the way, there's no one else. No one. I mean, except one of us. Yes, indeed. That was nightmare enough for any man. One of us. Yes, surely it must be so, unless... A new idea suggested itself to my mind. Rapidly I considered it. The light increased. Poirot's mysterious doings, his hints, they all fitted in. Fool that I was not to have thought of this possibility before, and what a relief for us all. No, John, I said. It isn't one of us. How could it be? Well, I know, but still, who else is there? Can't you guess? No. I looked cautiously round and lowered my voice. Dr. Bowerstein, I whispered. Impossible. Not at all. But what earthly interest could he have in my mother's death? That I don't see, I confessed. But I'll tell you this. Poirot thinks so. Poirot? Does he? How do you know? I told him of Poirot's intense excitement on hearing that Dr. Bowerstein had been at Stiles on that fateful night, and added, he said twice, that alters everything. And I've been thinking. You know Inglethorpe said he had put down the coffee in the hall? Well, it was just then that Bowerstein arrived. Isn't it possible that, as Inglethorpe brought him through the hall... The doctor dropped something into the coffee in passing. Hmm, said John. It would have been very risky. Yes, but it was possible. And then, how could he know it was her coffee? No, old fellow, I don't think that'll wash. But I had remembered something else. You're quite right. 
That wasn't how it was done. Listen. And I then told him of the cocoa sample, which Poirot had taken to be analysed. John interrupted just as I had done. But look here, Bowerstein had had it analysed already. Yes, yes, that's the point. I didn't see it either until now. Don't you understand? Bowerstein had it analysed, and that's just it. If Bowerstein's the murderer, nothing could be simpler than for him to substitute some ordinary cocoa for his sample and send that to be tested. And, of course, they would find no strychnine. But no one would dream of suspecting Bowerstein or think of taking another sample except Poirot, I added with a belated recognition. Yes, but what about the bitter taste that Coco won't disguise? Well, we've only his word for that. And there are other possibilities. He's admittedly one of the world's greatest toxicologists. One of the world's greatest what? Say it again. He knows more about poisons than almost anybody, I explained. Well, my idea is that perhaps he's found some way of making strychnine tasteless. Or it may not have been strychnine at all, but some obscure drug no one's ever heard of, which produces much the same symptoms. Hmm. Yes, that might be, said John. But look here, how could he have got at the cocoa? That wasn't downstairs. No, it wasn't, I admitted reluctantly. And then, suddenly, a dreadful possibility flashed through my mind. I hoped and prayed it would not occur to John also. I glanced sideways at him. He was frowning, perplexedly, and I drew a deep breath of relief, for the terrible thought that had flashed across my mind was this— that Dr. Bowerstein might have had an accomplice. Yet surely it could not be. Surely no woman as beautiful as Mary Cavendish could be a murderess. Yet beautiful women had been known to poison. Only ugly women have a reason to kill people. <laughs> to be only ugly people can be as ugly inside as they are outside. Surely not a stunner like Mary. <laughs> but I love how he's just like dining out on being like the person with some sort of knowledge to Cavendish about it. It was like, yeah, didn't you know? Isn't it obvious? It's like, mm. well, it wasn't to you two minutes ago, dude. So yeah, exactly. like, well, and also like we all know <laughs> listening to this story, because we know there's still five more chapters left that he's not right here. He's going to be wrong. He seems to keep having these revelations that even like, right from the off, you're like, mm. no, mate, yeah, come, on, like, come along, use your brain. All these things that he should really keep to himself. I thought that too. He's literally just like holding up a big sign going, this is what I think. And like allowing yeah. people to just <laughs> give me possibly. attention. I really hope that's what happens. I hope like they will get away with it because he's just like allowed them all to just like completely burn all their like tracks and stuff. <laughs> And suddenly, I remembered that first conversation at tea on the day of my arrival, and the gleam in her eyes as she had said that poison was a woman's weapon. How agitated she had been on that fateful Tuesday evening. Had Mrs. Inglethorpe discovered something between her and Bowerstein, and threatened to tell her husband? Was it to stop that denunciation that the crime had been committed, then I remembered that enigmatical conversation between Poirot and Evelyn Howard. Was this what they had meant? Was this the monstrous possibility that Evelyn had tried not to believe? Yes, it all fitted in. No wonder Miss Howard had suggested hushing it up. Now I understood that unfinished sentence of hers, Emily herself and in my heart I agreed with her. Would not Mrs. Inglethorpe have preferred to go unavenged rather than have such terrible dishonour fall upon the name of Cavendish? There's another thing, said John, suddenly, and the unexpected sound of his voice made me start guiltily. Something which makes me doubt if what you say can be true. What's that? I asked thankful that he had gone away from the subject of how the poison could have been introduced into the cocoa. Why, the fact that Bowerstein demanded a post-mortem. 
he needn't have done so. Little Wilkins would have been quite content to let it go at heart disease. Yes, I said doubtfully. But we don't know. Perhaps he thought it safer in the long run. Someone might have talked afterwards. Then the Home Office might have ordered exhumation. The whole thing would have come out then, and he would have been in an awkward position, for no one would have believed that a man of his reputation could have been deceived into calling it heart disease. Yes, that's possible, admitted John. Still, he added, I'm blessed if I can see what his motive could have been. I trembled. Look here, I said. I may be altogether wrong, and remember all this is in confidence. Oh, of course, that goes without saying. We had walked as we talked, and now we passed through the little gate into the garden. Voices rose near at hand, for tea was spread out under the sycamore tree, as it had been on the day of my arrival. Cynthia was back from the hospital, and I placed my chair beside her and told her of Poirot's wish to visit the dispensary. Of course, I'd love him to see it. He'd better come to tea there one day. I must fix it up with him. Oh, he's such a dear little man. But he is funny. He made me take a, a brooch out of my tie the other day and put it in again because he said it wasn't straight. I laughed. It's quite a mania with him. <laughs> yes, isn't it? We were silent for a minute or two and then glancing in the direction of Mary Cavendish and dropping her voice. Cynthia said, Mr. Hastings? Yes? After tea, I want to talk to you. Her glance at Mary had set me thinking. I fancied that between these two there existed very little sympathy. For the first time, it occurred to me to wonder about the girl's future. Mrs. Inglethorpe had made no provisions of any kind for her, but I imagined that John and Mary would probably insist on her making her home with them, at any rate until the end of the war. John, I knew, was very fond of her, and would be sorry to let her go. John, who had gone into the house, now reappeared. His good-natured face wore an unaccustomed frown of anger. "'Confound those detectives! I can't think what they're after!' They've been in every room of the house, turning things inside out and upside down. It really is too bad. I suppose they took advantage of our all being out. I shall go for that fellow, Jap, when I next see him. Lot of Paul Prize, grunted Miss Howard. Lawrence opined that they had to make a show of doing something. Mary Cavendish said nothing. After tea, I invited Cynthia to come for a walk and we sauntered off into the woods together. Well, I inquired, as soon as we were protected from prying eyes by the leafy screen. With a sigh, Cynthia flung herself down and tossed off her hat. The sunlight, piercing through the branches, turned the auburn of her hair to quivering gold. Mr. Hastings, you're always so kind, and you know such a lot. It struck me at this moment that Cynthia was really a very charming girl, much more charming than Mary, who never said things of that kind. Well, I asked, benignantly, and she hesitated. I want to ask your advice. What should I do? Do? Yes. You see, Aunt Emily always told me I should be provided for. I suppose she forgot, or... or didn't think she was likely to die. Anyway, I am not provided for, and I don't know what to do. Do you think I ought to go away from here at once? Oh, good heavens, no. They don't want to part with you, I'm sure. Cynthia hesitated a moment, plucking up the grass with her tiny hands. Then she said, Mrs. Cavendish does. She hates me. Hates you? I cried, astonished. Cynthia nodded. Yes, I don't know why, but she, she can't bear me, and he can't either. There I know you're wrong, I said warmly. On the contrary, John is very fond of you. Oh yes, John, 
I meant Lawrence. Not, of course, that I care whether Lawrence hates me or not. Still, it's rather horrid when no one loves you, isn't it? But they do, Cynthia, dear, I said earnestly. I'm sure you are mistaken. Look, th there is John and, and Miss Howard. Cynthia nodded rather gloomily. Yes, John likes me, I think. And, of course, Evie, for all her gruff ways, wouldn't be unkind to a fly. But Lawrence never speaks to me if he can help it, and Mary can hardly bring herself to be civil to me. She wants Evie to stay on. He's begging her to, but she doesn't want me to. And, and I don't know what to do. Suddenly, the poor child burst out crying. I don't know what possessed me. Her beauty, perhaps, as she sat there, with the sunlight glinting down on her head. Perhaps the sense of relief at encountering somebody who so obviously could have no connection with the tragedy. Perhaps honest pity for her youth and loneliness. Anyway, I leant forward, and taking her little hand, I said awkwardly, Marry me, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> he has read that situation so badly. What a tit. Like, what? Like, would, it go, would you like to go for a walk? Would you like me like... to speak to John? Would you like <laughs> me to lend you some money? Like, no. Why? What? No. Why? No. Why on earth would you think that that was the right thing to say in that situation? Genuine plum. He's so simple. He is. So <laughs> it's like a, a, a woman literally flops under a tree and takes her hat off and he's proposing. He's such She's a crying. Sad... She's literally going through something and he's, pro he's propositioning her. He's got a hero complex, hasn't he? He's got this thing of like, oh, women are these damsels in distress that I must look after and save. And they're all innocent. And they're all these kind of helpless people that I need to shelter and look after and can do no wrong and are virtuous. And it's like, they're not, they're, they're complicated people just like men are. And you're just being completely blindsided because you like how their face looks or the fact that they've got not boots. to mention he was smitten as a kitten on mary five minutes ago yeah exactly yeah. because the sunlight's fallen on her hair a certain way yeah uh, because she's not being uh, like icy yeah exactly she said something nice wow. well she must marry me immediately <laughs> that's a, that a, a very sweet typical... isn't he uh unfortunately oh, that's quite a typical of men there's a woman who yeah. like, must fancy me. Yes, she couldn't possibly be doing it because it's her job to, because she's a waitress or something like that. <laughs> oh, dear. So depressing. Yeah. And this was a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and men I... still suck. Yeah, as you said before, maybe like some things have changed, some things haven't. Some things haven't changed at all. <laughs> Is there some like Agatha Christie... Uh, she has made some in well. There's some, but she's made some interesting male characters in this, and it's very interesting to see if she's making some comments about the fallibilities male nature in compared. Yeah, to, I'd say apart from Poirot, a male quite right, simple. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying she's not doing. She's not making. Maybe I'm just reading into it, but I'm not sure an equivalent male writer would made the same sort of fallibility about being so stupid i don't know no yeah, i think, I, I, think yeah. I think what i'm enjoying about the kind of the the genders of the characters in this is how mary's very ballsy the fact that she's just literally standing up to her husband at this particular time where he is the money he is the person who keeps a roof over her head and going well how dare you criticize me for my friends who do you think you are like that's so modern Mm -hmm. For a woman to do that in like the 1920s, so like I, I actually have quite a lot of respect for the female characters in this book. They've actually been written with some backbone and some guts and their own wants and their own dreams and things that are yeah. separate from their husbands and the men in their lives. It's it's really nice to read. And actually, as you said, it's it's the men who come across as quite silly and naive and simple and easily led. And in fact, yeah, it's all the women, isn't it? All the women have got either either a strength or, or they know their own mind or they're, yeah. you know, they're, they're given a job of, of 
intelligent. It's the fact that Cynthia is is a chemist. Like, yeah, it's, just, it's just good stuff. During the First World War is when women first entered the workforce because there were jobs and there were vacancies because all the men had gone sure. to war. And she's obviously commented on that early on in this chapter where she was yeah, like, yeah, women yeah. have done really well during the war. And so it's obviously her kind of trying to push that thing of like, you know, women can do the things that men do and women can do jobs and women can have careers and women are people, funnily enough. They're not just what? they're not just people who are associated to the husbands and boyfriends and men in their lives. They actually are their own defined individual. <laughs> yeah. Unwittingly, I had hit upon a sovereign remedy for her tears. She sat up at once, drew her hand away, and said with some asperity Don't be silly. Thank you, Cynthia, uh, for some sanity. <laughs> preach. I was a little annoyed. I'm not being silly. I'm asking you to do me the honour of becoming my wife. To my intense surprise, Cynthia burst out laughing. And called me a... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm with her. That's a completely appropriate response to that. Yeah. That is completely yeah. appropriate. To my intense surprise, Cynthia burst out laughing and called me a funny dear. It's perfectly sweet of you, she said. But... You know you don't want to. <sighs> yes, I do. I've got... Never mind what you've got. You don't really want to. And I don't either. Well, uh, of course, that, that settles it, I said stiffly. But I, I don't see anything to laugh at. There's nothing funny about a proposal. No, indeed, said Cynthia. Somebody might accept you next time. <laughs> goodbye oh. you've, you've, cheered me, you've cheered me up very much <laughs> <laughs> it's so just it's so sad it's so sad but it's just the way you said there's nothing funny about a proposal it's like there is when you ask a girl you're not dating out of the blue while she's crying about the future of her life like yeah you are completely taking advantage of of a young girl who's feeling lost and hoping to basically own her. Oh, That's yeah. basically what he's doing here. He might have been able to find a little way out there if he'd have been clever enough, which, of course, we know that he's not. When she started laughing, he'd have been like, there you go, cheered you up. See, yeah, that exactly. worked. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is so yeah. true. He could have, so could have saved Got some... Uh, fake proposal gag again, again Casey, you know me. <laughs> yeah. That classic, will you marry me? <laughs> save some face. But he's got no. He's got. He, he, you know, he possibly would have had a chance if he'd have been a little bit slower. Yeah, he, he probably would have had a chance if he'd actually asked her out. If he'd actually yeah. like been like, "Oh, Cynthia, I'd love to take you out for dinner sometime." I mean, I know that like in olden times, courting was very different. But even in Pride and Prejudice, they met at a few dances first, and then you call on the lady and you go for a walk through the grounds, chaperone. And by you don't just spring the question out of nowhere the like third time you've met them. Definitely not. Yeah, the, yeah. The men had to fill up the women's dance cards, didn't they? And then yeah, they'd exactly. pop round with flowers. Uh, to the to the to the parents' house, and then you might see where it goes from there. Yeah, could you imagine that story? Oh, so how did she propose? Well, basically, I was in a pit of despair, one worrying about the fact that I was about to be homeless, and then he proposed to me. <laughs> like it's not a romantic my, story. My knight in shining armor. <laughs> yes, <I> wound immediately. <laughs> he went. She ain't got any better options. I can nab her now. And with a final uncontrollable burst of merriment. She vanished through the trees. <laughs> Thinking over the interview, it struck me as being profoundly unsatisfactory. It occurred to me suddenly that I would go down to the village and look up Bowerstein. Somebody ought to be keeping an eye on the fellow. At the same time, it would be wise to allay any suspicions he might have to his being suspected. I remembered how Poirot had relied on my diplomacy. Accordingly, I went to the little house with the apartments card inserted in the window, where I knew he lodged, and tapped on the door. An old woman came and opened it. Good afternoon, I said pleasantly. Is Dr. Bowerstein in? She stared at me. And then she <gasps> says something. 
I did not think we'd get um, the woman yeah. at the door. It's, it's like an innkeeper or something, like the lady that oh, does the board house. Oh, we She's going to be just be like a bearer of news. Yeah, I, I know we visit Les Mis, but she can she can she, she she sing every line like they're doing like the first half. It's like good afternoon. Like just <laughs> you love stuff. you love a singing character, don't you, David? I do, but yeah. well, we haven't had any. So make her dramatic and gossipy, but she sings. Do you mean like everything's I'll need like price? Yeah, it's it's all like oh I've oh haven't I got the most delicious news you've ever heard coming? She stared at me. Haven't you heard? <laughs> piano, suspension piano. He's there. He's outside. Meet is running. <laughs> <laughs> Heard what? About him. What about him? He's took. Took? Dead? <gasps> no. Took by the police. <gasps> by the police? I gasped. Do you mean they've arrested him? Yes, that's it. And... I waited to hear no oh. more, but tore up the village to find Poirot. End of chapter. How rude to just run off. I know. <laughs> I was in the middle of a song. Yeah. Oi, you, come back. I'm, I'm, yeah. This is my moment in the book. <laughs> You've like finished my life halfway short. doing an audition when you're, you're like, right, it's yeah. like, that, that will do. The hand yeah. goes up, yeah. They're like, thanks. That's enough. <laughs> we'll Don't run know. away in the middle of a bar. We'll let you know. You're not going to let me know because I didn't finish my stuff. I clearly, yeah, I clearly didn't do well enough. Oh, <laughs> I was a very excited. So, Doctor Bernstein, be Bernstein. I've done it again. Bernstein. <laughs> Do- <laughs> How many Dr. Do- Bernstein? I don't know. We need a chalkboard, it. David. A chalkboard for every time he does it wrong. Oh. And he takes a point off every when we do the quiz. He loses. No, oh, yeah. you, you lose the no. point. No, I have no the only way yet. I'm gonna win. <laughs> 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 oh dear! So Doctor Baustein's been arrested. I wonder if that's. I wonder if Jap has been following the same line as Hastings, or if Poirot's actually said anything to the Scotland Yard guys. I don't think he said anything because. No. He's been at he his boarding his house himself. His yeah, exactly. So I have a feeling that they've probably just followed the same line of kind of breadcrumbs as Hastings does and, and, and have come out at the wrong conclusion as well, just like he has. Mm. Oh, dear. But I mean, a very, very interesting chapter. Nice to hear more from Cynthia. I feel like she's a character that we just don't see enough of. Yeah. She's kind of forgotten like a little Cynthia. bit. Yeah, she kind of flies a bit under the radar, really. Um, she could also be a murderer if I well, have my yeah, own. she could be. She's gonna have but one last one last point to play, even if it's like a final bit of information at the very least. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm hoping Someone about the dispensary. Yeah, we haven't had that yet, have we? Yeah, well, even if it's the case she's not the murderer, it it seems like well, actually no, I suppose we know that the chemist in the town supplied the strychnine. But as people have said, maybe it's not strychnine, maybe it was something else. Maybe yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't none know why wiser. I'm trying to work it out. I don't think I'm going to none the wiser. And the fact that Bowerstein's been arrested is not a good sign for him mm. being a suspect. Yeah. I was hoping that more would come from the extra coffee cup thing with Lawrence. I was hoping there would be more drama off the back of that. Him just yeah, kind of going, what does that mean? He wanted him to have no idea. And that was the plan all yeah. along. Yeah, so no, I, I was wanting him. He'll to be say something or worried or do you know what I mean? It would have been far more dramatic if that had happened. Yeah, it was just all a bit like meh. What was, was what was it again? If there was an extra coffee cup, you can rest. You can in, rest in peace. It? You can rest in peace. Find the extra coffee cup and rest in peace, or something like that. That's very cryptic, isn't it? It's very. Like, it is very cryptic. <laughs> yeah, but I was just Not hoping that like he would react more. He'd be like really worried of like, oh crap, like I'm going to get caught or, oh, I've worked it out or do you know what I mean? But it was just kind of like, well, what are you chatting about? And that was it. Yeah. Which is a bit boring. It's probably the most boring outcome that could have come from it. I mean, the the non-shock of the whole chapter was John and Mary having issues in their marriage. I mean, anyone could have seen that happening a mile away. 
but we've had it finally from the horse's mouth as it were where he's not happy that she's hanging out with Bowerstein she says that maybe she loves him I wouldn't be surprised if that's the reason why he was in the house. I mean, so we're all in the running still with our guesses. I'd say Mary Cavendish is looking like a really good bet right now. I think I'm quite quite jealous of David's bet on Mary. Well, I um, don't know, but then I'm always I'm always of the opinion it's like, oh no, it's too early in the race it's to too like too obvious. Yeah, but then it's not necessarily because Bowerstein's been arrested, but it might be that that's a, she could have done it in some other way. Uh, but then Lawrence is still a very unfeatured character. Yeah. Very. You've got to like, he's still mysterious. We don't really know any background to, we don't really know what he's like as a person, to, to be no, honest. That's true. But you remember that when Bowerstein lent over Emily, she said, Alfred. So there's obviously yeah. enough of a similarity between those two men that it's completely possible that he could have been the person who dressed up as Alfred and went to the chemist. It wouldn't be surprised. I do not think if it's Bowerstein, there's no chance that it's, yeah, he's he's obviously worked with somebody. And you're right, it's more likely to be Mary. But then what's to say? Yeah. Oh, I play with Lawrence at the Bowls Club. Didn't you know? And that's like, that you just learned, yeah. Now, is this just going too well goose chase? Okay. Oh. I wonder if Bowerstein dressed up as Alfred for the chemist just as a red herring to lay a thing. Because as, as Poro said, the evidence is too convenient. So he might have bought strychnine from the chemist, but maybe they didn't actually use the strychnine because looking at the timeline, strychnine is actually him. a very hard... Yes. So I wonder if they actually stole the poison from Cynthia's mm. dispensary and then just went to the chemist and asked for strychnine to lay that thinking but actually maybe the poison's not with a big neon it's something a big else neon sign with a exactly. finger pointing down going look what's I mean, going that, on that checks we're talking about a little village where everybody knows everybody why would yeah. you just walk into the local boots and get and or get the poison that is the murder weapon no, yeah exactly it's valid. does stink and i i wonder if like that's why Poirot wants to see the dispensary and was asking about the cupboard with the poisons in because I think he's realised that the timeline doesn't match up with strychnine and the bitter taste and all the rest of it. But maybe there's another poison that presents the same symptoms or or maybe something that she they could have taken with the dispensary that delayed the reaction or something. So what's the, uh, what's the next chapter for us, Josh? What's chapter 10 called? Chapter 10 is entitled The Arrest. Oh, so I'm guessing that's just about Baustein and the continuation of him being arrested and probably Poirot going, oh, you absolute idiots at Scotland Yard. You've now got a man in your... You're, you're, you're ballsing up the inquest you're, mm. in the investigation. This is the, this is technically the first arrest, isn't it? Because Alfred was not arrested. It is. But yeah, and, and as, as Jap said, you know, thank you, Poirot, for, for making it that he's innocent because if we had arrested him and it wasn't him, it would have looked really bad on us. So that's why this is almost kind of like, uh, oh, come on guys. Like you're probably going to end up looking like idiots here. If this turns out not to yeah, be the, the first arrest for. can't be the real, no. the real McCoy can. No, uh, absolutely not. Never the case. Hmm. Well, if you've got any thoughts or opinions on this chapter, you can message us on the lazy book club at gmail.com. Or if you have any suspicions that you can put in a concise manner, perhaps 240 characters or so, you can do so on Twitter with our handle at Lazy Book Club Pod. Or if there's an arresting image you wish to share, do it on Instagram at Lazy Book Club Pod. Yeah. If you've had any awkward proposal moments, we'd love to hear about them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was in Costa the other day face. and she said, oh, have a nice day. And I went, will you marry me? <laughs> I know what the appropriate response here is. Will you Sun marry me? lightly on her hair and it looked <laughs> browner than I thought. <laughs> she gave me oh. extra whip on my, uh, on my frozen <laughs> knocker. <laughs> if you'll pardon the pun. Oh, dear. <laughs> We're also on TikTok, and when I have the opportunity, I put some of the videos up on there. The videos are only actually available to those on our Patreon, and for the small fee of $3 a month, you get the videos so you can watch our phone calls. You can see Josh's amazing character voices and personalities as he's doing his and thing. cats. You get to see the cats. Occasionally cats. Yeah. What's, what's the weirdest <laughs> thing you've got within reach right now, David?
<laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've got nearby, Matt? Um, well, I'm at my parents' house. I have a nuts and bolts man playing a guitar. Well, that's pretty cool. I've got uh, yeah. I've got this. Oh, that's awesome. This is a small cactus in a pot pin cushion. Well, if you'd like to send us any pictures of weird things that you have in reach, then you've already got our details to send them there. <laughs> what an odd way to finish the podcast. But anyway. Oh, yeah. Sorry about I that. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And we will see you next week for Chapter 10. See you then. Bye. Bye.